Welcome to the Past Present Feature Podcast. In today's episode, Bulgarian filmmaker Pavel Vesnikov discusses his journey in the film industry and his film Windless. He talks about the importance of world premiering at the Karlo Vivari International Film Festival, a significant milestone for him. He shares his early influences, including the films Taste of Cherry and Three Iron, which inspired him to pursue filmmaking. Pavel speaks on the challenges of making films in Bulgaria and the impact of working in the TV industry, the importance of realism in his films, and how his perspective has evolved over the years. We discuss the influence of the Romanian New Wave on his filmmaking style, the importance of capturing the mundane and authentic aspects of human existence, and the challenges of distributing and finding an audience for art films. We also touch on the use of specific techniques in Windless, such as the one-to-one aspect ratio and the incorporation of home video footage. Vesnikov shares his thoughts on the themes of memory, time, and identity, and his desire to create movies that allow viewers to reflect on their own lives and existence. He also mentions his upcoming project, Deconstruction, which explores the concept of going back in time. I'm going to read a quote real quick and tell me who you think it is. For me, realism is the most important component of film. There is nothing more magical than reality. The simplest things are always the most difficult to express. That's why reality is the embodiment of a good story and a film in general. Who is that? I think this is me like 10 or 12 years ago. 12 years ago. Still wow. think like this. Yeah. So you've been doing this for a minute then. And this interview, I think I gave it after I won the Grand Prix at Clermont Ferrand Film Festival. Mm-hmm. And it was... Back in the days, 2013, I think it was because I'm coming from a very small country. We don't have very big cinema industry. We don't have any industry at all, actually. It's at all. Yeah, really. It's 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 pretty thin. Yeah, we we, we have a national film center the, that is funding movies, but we are producing like between two, four, maximum five feature films per year. And uh, how, how excited are you for Carlo Vivar? Do you feel good? Are you excited to have premiere it there? Yeah, actually, I'm very, very happy because I can give you a little bit of more context on this world premiere and why it's so important for me. Uh, my first movie, German Lessons, we unfortunately, it, came out during the COVID times. Mm, fun. Yeah, and we were shortlisted for some very big festivals and at the end, all the, some of the festivals didn't happen, like Carlo Vivari, Lucarno. Oh, yeah. Other festivals made their programs shorter with selecting fewer films. And actually, this is my second film and for the first time, I will have a proper world premiere. It's, it's a very long journey. I am planning to enjoy it nice you know it's so key isn't it to just be in the moment and try to enjoy it but it's also not so easy sometimes because you're always thinking about either like the past as far as what you wish you could have done thinking ahead it's it's so important especially during the festival premiere to just be in the moment and to enjoy well let's talk about let's go back into the past and stay there for a minute you know what was your first memory being a filmmaker where you were conscious about oh i'm a filmmaker i think i have Maybe it is 2007, like 17, 18 years ago in my apartment. I just finished high school. I'm in my uh, first year studying cinema. And I was mm-hmm. watching a movie that was called Three Iron. Three, Three Iron, Iron by Kim ki Korean director. This was, I, I liked it so much that this was the moment that I felt, okay, so I have to see... What am I going to do right now? So the synopsis of that is uh, Jahi is a lonely drifter who spends his nights in one empty vacation home after another. However, Taesuk is not your usual squatter as the courteous young man always makes sure to show his absent and unknowing host his gratitude by doing small household tasks or making simple improvements before moving on. One day, Taesuk mistakes a quiet home for an empty one and stumbles across an abused housewife in urgent need of his intervention. So yeah, what was it about this movie that just grabbed you? I think it was like I was discovering for the first time what uh, visual language can do as a medium, as a separate medium than literature and all the other forms of 
arts. Gotcha. It's very yeah. metaphysical. It's quite realistic, but also very metaphysical and poetic in a way. Until this day, it's, I don't know how you can make a movie like this. You know, I mean, the one thing I love and hate about this podcast or talk, in talking to fellow filmmakers, especially international filmmakers, is I, I love it because I'm finding out about movies that I've never heard of before that I put on my list and, and can watch when I have time. But also I hate it because I haven't seen them yet. Do you know what I mean? It's like, man, we're like, you know, we're so it's probably all of us, though, right? Like, you know, yeah, it's yeah, just it's, like just deal with it. Just push, you know, go find the movie and push play. Let's check it out. So I'm just telling for this movie. I don't want to discuss it. In, this is just one kind of memory that I have. I know that there are so many movies that I am also not able to watch all the films that I want to watch. I mean, feature films are what, about 100 years old, maybe? Yeah. In the last 25 years, there are so much more movies that came out. It's crazy. Being an American film watcher growing up, you know, you think you don't know any better. You think all the movies there are are the ones that Hollywood puts out, you know? It's like, oh, the ones in the theater, that's what it is, or the ones that you see on DVD later. It's it's just crazy, the volume that, that, that's been made. And, and at least, you know, in a time right now where it seems like films in a lot of ways are undervalued by society, at least here in America, you know, like the film sales are down, cinemas are closing, da 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 the sky is falling. It's very comforting as, as a cinephile to uh, be able to kind of discover old films that I never knew existed, you know? Anyways, moving right along. What was your first film that you remember making? I was in high school, actually, and we were going to graduate. I was part of a class. They were teaching us some kind of philosophy class. And my graduation work like thesis or some kind of homework that I had to, to do was uh, because I was the only guy in the whole school that h had a small camera. Okay. Oh, you had, you were the guy with the camera. Yeah. My father bought some very old school camera that was using some kind of small VHS tapes. Okay. The mini DV uh, ones, maybe before mini DV. Okay. SVHS. SVHS, something Damn. like this. And uh, I, I had to shoot my friends and my classmates and we were going to make some kind of greetings to our teachers and stuff like this. A very simple task, mm -hmm. but in the end it turned out I made some kind of video essay about our meaningless existence and why sometimes school is making young people kill themselves. It was very dark. Yeah, it sounds like a comedy. Yeah. Is it a comedy? Or? No, no, it was no, very dark kidding. and it's kind of like a confession. Like I was riotting against something. And sure. it was received really bad when we showed it in the mm -hmm. audience. But our literature teacher, actually, after we finished it and I was going home and she met me in the street and she asked me how I did this movie and that there was something in it that maybe I have to think about studying for film director. Uh -huh. And back then I, I didn't knew that actually you can study for film director. Right. Same. Yeah. yeah. Because I, I'm not coming from a cinema family. I'm, same. My parents are not connected with this kind of art form. So do you think without that moment you would have taken a different path if that English teacher didn't stop and say, hey, you should maybe pursue this? Yeah, I was going to uh, study history or political science, something like this. I was preparing. I actually started studying history and cinema in two different universities at the same time. There's one little life moments that can pivot your, your whole path. I mean, I'm from North Carolina too, and uh, I'm North Carolina, small town, and um, there was no sort of like realistic chance to like be a filmmaker who does that you're supposed to work nine to five you know making like above minimum wage it's so valuable when you find even one person that that supports you and believes in you and thinks you can do it my mom being the person for me you know where it's like really you think i should go to film school yeah you do this all the time already like you're already making this stuff like you know having someone believe in you before you believe in yourself is is such a wonderful valuable thing it's my mom for me as well nice can I ask you, uh, what did your time look like between that big moment, that big life moment you just you just shared, 
And uh, I don't know, like, I guess your your series of short films, like, how did it lead up into these short films that, that, that went into all these, I've got it right here, went into uh, many great film festivals. You were at Locarno, Sarajevo, Clermont Ferrand, Edinburgh, I mean, da 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 So, like, how did you kind of move from being a baby filmmaker to someone who just produced and directed or just directed a bunch of really good short films? I started study cinema in 2006. Mm-hmm. And it took me five years to make my first movie that started going to festivals. It's a very long period in my memory that I have. It, five years is not so much. There is a huge difference between the guy that I was in the beginning in 2006 and when I made this movie, which was called Trains. Mm-hmm. Um, I had a very serious period in which I was like uh, very influenced from literature, poetry, and I wanted to make a lot of uh, movies that are more focused on the form, visual mm-hmm. expressions, experimental movies. Like I was interested in authors like uh, Peter Greenway. Peter Greenway. Yeah, Peter Greenway. David mm-hmm. Lynch, his mm-hmm. early works, Andrei mm-hmm. Tarkovsky, and uh, Sergei Parajanov, a lot of highly conceptual filmmakers. It's kind of mystical films yeah, that yeah. they were creating. Oh, yeah. And but th- these were films that at this moment the budget that I was going to work with in my short films, and I was trying to make like a copy paste of these movies in a short form, which I believe. I had uh, disastrous results, I know really bad ones. And one day I just stumbled upon uh, a few short films. I don't know. I think one of the short films was directed by um, Andrea Arnold. She, she won an Oscar for best sh- short film. It was called Wasp. It was very realistic and I was like, uh, huh. started to make some small yeah. research. And then there is uh, two major things that happened. The first one is I watched a movie which was called Bawast. It it was like 2009, 2010, and it just had uh, won the best film at Sundance Film Festival, I believe. And it was uh, very realistic, very rough, without any music. Like uh, it was telling a very small natural mm. story oh yeah ballast oh yeah. Yeah, yeah 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 this really changed my perspective on everything and i it and after this moment it was much easier to for me to start imagining some kind of story that is happening in my society in my country in my hometown that was told in this kind of so was ballast kind of your first uh it was like your first heavy realization of like realism in film would you say yeah 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 100%. Got you. yeah i think it's strange because until this day right now i still believe it it is the best example my favorite film in this kind of in this way of storytelling awesome, awesome. yeah yeah oh my god this takes me back i'm getting nostalgic now back yeah, yeah, me too <laughs> A beautiful film, really dark, <laughs> heavy stuff. Yeah, I hear you. Yeah. Okay, moving right along. So, you know, your short films, you did a trilogy of short films. It, say, it says here you did you did Inches of Suburbia Trains, which uh, is one. You had The per- Paraffin Prince, The Paraffin Prince, and Pride. Uh, yeah. So after that, you then did German Lessons, your first feature. Is it? So oh, Zeus. Yes, I okay. skipped over that. So Zeus, which premiered at Locarno in 2015. Damn, how did I miss that? Tell me about Zeus. What's up with that? Uh, I wanted to make a trilogy of short mm-hmm. films, but I also made a fourth film. So it's there are four films, not only three. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Doesn't fit into a trilogy package, but is it still part of the same uh, kind of theme or subject matter? Yeah. Ah, I love that. What is the common denominators w- w- across those films? The most important subject and the part of these short films is that all of the main characters that I'm talking about in these movies, all of them are part of the same uh, social 
part of society, like mm. a little bit below middle class. Mm-hmm. Okay, lower middle class is what we would call it. They have real struggles, but they have a little bit of a uh, little bit to work with. But they're on, they're teetering on an edge, kind of maybe. Yeah, yeah, very nice people, but always struggling with collapsing families, um, money difficulties, some kind of people on the edge of living, and all of them are living in the suburbia of Sofia okay. in the, this neighborhoods that are a little bit further away from the suburbs are always very fascinating whether you're talking about voting or whatever class class status yeah because it is kind of in between the rural and the city right it's like that middle ground where interesting things happen where Mm -hmm. big things are decided yeah i feel like i didn't ask you by the way where are you from in, in bulgaria i'm from sofia which is the capital of bulgaria that's the biggest you still live there like yeah do you love it? Does it feel like it's at home? Uh, yes, yes. Well, <laughs> that's good enough. That's a start. It. That's like anywhere at this point, no matter what, you know. Like at Los Angeles, yeah. I love it. Yeah. But it's a pain in my ass, you know, sometimes. Okay, cool. So yeah. tell me about, um, okay, I love your filmography here. It's like you just stayed busy. You just, you got it. You just seemed like you were staying consistently busy. Uh, your film German Lessons 2020, uh, you, were t- you were saying how COVID kind of derailed it a little bit as far as festival premiere, but how did that go? Tell me about that film, if you don't mind. Actually, the film, the script was written in 2014. In this period between 2010, 2015, I was becoming like a star director in Bulgaria. I was the youngest one who got funding for feature films. Everything was happening really, really quickly. I was going in a very positive direction, but unfortunately, before we we have these problems with the COVID pandemic, uh, because we are here in Bulgaria, we were part of the Soviet. No, we weren't. We weren't exactly part of the Soviet Union, okay. but we were like almost part of it. A lot of things are not happening in the best possible way for the normal mm-hmm. people in former Eastern European countries. Because we have a lot of corruption that we are uh, today, like everything is much better because we are part of the European Union, part of NATO, and the society has changed a lot. But back then, like 15 years ago, I got the funding for the feature film and then I I was waiting like five, six years to, to be able to shoot the movie because we have problem with the funding, with the National Center, a lot of directors were changing. We have some problems with corruption and I missed the moment yeah, yeah, yeah. in this uh, successful run in the festivals because they wait for your feature films, but when you skip six <laughs> years and you're not making anything, it's very difficult to go back on track. And then we made it and the COVID pandemic came. This is the stuff I like to talk about, though. I love to talk about that conflict and that struggle because it's like it is kind of two parts for me. It's like, one, how do you react to it? But also, two, like, don't you appreciate it in retrospect? I mean, usually like the growth requires discomfort and like struggles and conflict definitely give you some sort of reward later on that you don't see while you're going through it. Why is this happening to me? This was my chance and you think it's your only chance. What was it for you? I mean, uh, I guess my specific question would be, did it hurt? Did it feel like it was slipping through your fingers at the time? Uh, I totally understand your question and what you're talking. And uh, Mm. it is exactly the way you say it. First, this is what I want to say, that if I made German lessons in 2014, Mm. it was going to be a really terrible movie, I believe. And this gap between these five, six years, it's huge in terms of personal growth and the place where you are experiences. I became father. I changed the way I was living. For these six years that I was waiting, I actually, it happened by chance, but I was working all the time in the TV okay. industry. I, I directed a lot of TV series in Bulgaria. In, in, nice. Actually, I did the biggest one. What's that one called? They're mainly local, but okay. I don't believe you have a chance of seeing it. But the one is called Father's Day, the Devil's okay. Throat. You can see it on IMDb. But it was a very good experience for me, like challenging myself 
to mm-hmm. see the commercial part of movie making right. because I was mm-hmm. focused on art house movies and all the films that I'm doing are entirely art house or artistic driven but in the TV series you have the opportunity to experiment with language mm-hmm. to experiment with different genres and stuff like this, which I like the water. Can you talk more about how it, working in more commercial space uh, helped with your following films? Like, uh, like you were saying, genres. Uh, what else? I mean, what else? What else? What, other, what else did you take away from that experience that you didn't have before? You were just focused on, I guess, more subjective, uh, more art films with maybe less genre story forms or, or whatever it might have been for you. Yeah, I was very shy. As a person, very, very shy. As a director, as a guy, as everything. And when you're directing a lot of fact, the most famous actors mm. every day for a very long period, you stop being shy. It happens just like this. You, you learn how not to be mm. shy, which is very helpful in making movies. With experience, it's very good to have experience, of course, but for me... I don't believe that there is some kind of formula that you can take to be successful. But what I learned, and I believe now I have much more in me, is that it, now I, it takes less mm. time for me to understand what I don't want to do. It's still difficult to find out what exactly you want to do, but if something is not you know, happening in a proper gotcha. way, I immediately can sense it. And this is something that I developed in... You have like a little radar that goes off? Just a little intuitive thing that it tells you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's just not like this. We have to stop and change it completely. I don't have time to to see how it goes. So it's, yeah. And the other thing which I really liked is that I really hate to rehearse, make rehearsals with the actors. Because you want to make it, uh, I'm assuming you want to keep it fresh as possible. You don't want it to be beaten to death. You know, I switched to document. I spent too much time talking about this, but I was doing fiction for first 10 years or 15 years or whatever, only fiction. And then I went and did a documentary and, uh, and I've been doing documentaries ever since. But uh, I love just not have, I love bypass. I love just going right to the real, right to the authentic you know, and not having to worry about uh, it not feeling authentic, right? And I remember like making fiction, it's always this concern as a director of like my bullshit radar going off with the acting sometimes. We're like, no, that's not real. It, it feels like acting, you know? So I, I get it as far as I think preparation's valuable, but yeah, also you don't want it to feel like acting or like it's too rehearsed, right? Like you can see through it. You can kind of see, you can see it and it's the worst fucking thing ever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the worst. Yeah. So your new film, Windless, I, I enjoyed it. It's very good. I feel like you clearly hang your hat on capturing realism in film. And of course your, your quote reflects that. And now I understand why. And I like that you were going for the opposite direction before you watched Ballast. I love that. That was the turning point. It's so cool to know. And that takes me back to 08 and like my own time back then to portray life without excessive stylization or dramatization. Realism in film. It's an attempt to capture the mundane, the ordinary, and the authentic aspects of human existence. So my question is, why is capturing realism so important to you? Well, first, I want to just to add a little bit of context that in Windless, it's for the first time that I feel that I'm going a little bit above this concept that you just mentioned. Because until Windless, I, w- I never used music in my films before. And I, all of the films were shot with a handheld camera. And here, the approach is a little bit more artistic. Like, I, I decided to intervene more than usual. So it's not a typical... A documentary visual aesthetic like uh, cinema variété. It's a little. I wanted. To, it's more uh, staged. Yeah, this is the right word. But still in the realistic direction. I was very influenced by the Romanian new wave in this period. Tell me about. I know nothing about the Romanian new wave. Tell me about that, please. Romanian Romanian new wave. It's. Uh, like, I think it's Iranian movies that I like a lot. 
from Iran and the Romanian films in the artistic world I think they are the best possible and you can you can check like my favorite mm-hmm. Romanian director is he's called Cristi Puyo and uh, he, his big, big breakthrough film is the death of Mr. Lazarescu you can check it after this they There, there was a Romanian film that won the Pounder in 2007, I believe. Three, three uh, four months, two, three weeks, two days, it was called. What is the Romanian new wave? Films within the movement often adopt a realist style, portraying the daily struggles and challenges faced by the ordinary people. It frequently critiques bureaucratic systems, highlighting the dehumanizing effects of bureaucratic processes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And they are dealing with uh, this subject of what is the word in English? Your burden from the past about the com- the communist regime. It's it, Romania was like Bulgaria in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, like uh, living under dictatorship and uh, changing to democracy. And people needed to get it off, get it out of their system, and talk about it. I guess right once it was finally able. Uh, not the people, no, no. People don't need it. J- just the people of, that make art need it. The normal people in oh, really? the real life, they, they hate don't, They just want to move on, they just want some kind of distraction more than a... Uh... Yeah, artistic always. Oh, wow. Same here. Well, I mean, I guess I'm always thinking, oh, the Europeans are more inclined, uh, maybe it's still true, more inclined to... Uh, As a society, they support their arts more and they have more intellectual pursuits. But sometimes it's like kind of all the same shit everywhere, isn't it? Yeah, it looks like this, but it's a total struggle. For In Romania, when this movie won the Palme d'Or in Cannes Film Festival, which is the biggest prize that you can win, and it was a total disaster in the local box office. Complete disaster. Nobody cared about this. In Bulgaria, I, I can tell you a situation here. A uh, Bulgarian movie, it was shown in Cannes, like 2017. And the distributors here in Bulgaria told the author to remove the logo of Cannes from the posters because nobody is going to see the movie. They think, oh, it's going to be slow and dark. We don't kind of, we don't want to see such. Oh, their perception of it. Oh, it's a Cannes movie. It's going to be artsy. We're not going to watch yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah, yeah. Same thing here a lot of times, but sometimes it meets in the middle. And that's when it's wonderful, when you have something that's commercial, but also emotionally, intellectually engaging. Does that sometimes happen? Yeah, yeah. It happens not very often, but I believe it happens. Yeah. And that's the sweet stuff. That's the sweet spot, I, I feel like. Back to your movie, Windless. It's a very beautifully directed and photographed film, like shooting one one to one, the aspect ratio. Yeah. What was the decision with that? I'm just curious, and, and I loved it a lot, but like, what, what motiv- motivated you to shoot it that way? What was the yeah. decision behind that? The decision was in two parts. First one is that I was shooting a lot of TV series and I was getting fed up with everything was looking the same for me, mm. and I wanted to distract myself in a way, but I didn't know how. We started to prepare for the movie and make some rehearsals with the camera and with the actors and we experimented with the spec ratios and actually in the movie because it is a, for, about a guy who comes home everything where he looks he feels some kind of emotion like a hidden emotion deep inside of him that uh, he doesn't have a place to go he feels it everything is very tight and I like this concept that the main character is like caged and you don't have a lot of space because when you see the movie most of the shot it looks like we have a lot of close-ups of the actors but actually they are not close-ups they are shot with a white angle lens but when you remove so much of the picture it looks like it's it's a close-up you know and it reminded me of a film called Son of Saul that I saw Uh, 2015, I saw it at a film festival that we were in, the Hungarian film. Remember that movie? Uh, it, was, it, it was a main inspiration for the Spectrate. Yes. I know it very well. Yeah. Nice, yeah. Just the way, uh, I, I love the way it was shot. And it sta- What did they stay on? Like a, I mean, it was shot one-to-one, I think, as well, maybe. And then also they stayed on like a 40 or 50 mil. 
Yeah, Which... but uh, the, the, they have a very beautiful concept because also it's a very small picture and a lot of the action is taking place outside of the frame and only it's told with the sound. And this concentration camp, you, you can make it much more realistic. The suggestion is crazy. The amount of suggestive storytelling just off the rails. Yeah, yeah. You're staying yeah, with his reactions. Funny. And it reminds me of how Gareth Edwards, remember the American director uh, Gareth Edwards, how he shot that movie, uh, the Alien Mexico City movie? Uh, he, shot it, he shot Godzilla the same way, but uh, is it called Monsters? It was Monsters, and then um, the way he shot Godzilla as well, where I, I hadn't really seen it much before in an American blockbuster film, but like how... Instead of showing the action, you're we're staying on the character's reaction of the action. And I just remember it being so powerful and cool. So yeah, Son of Saul reminded me uh, totally. Uh, I love to hear that that was an inspiration because I definitely got those vibes. And I just I loved also how your camera you never seemed to show something just to show it, but you had a point of view in mind. I think that was very obvious with this film. It seemed like even like the shot. I feel like the shot where you, it's early on in the film where they're in the car traveling into town. I think, and there's a shot that's kind of looking through the kind of curtains of the window of the car, something yeah. like this. Yeah, so it was just a really it kind of got it got my attention. This goes beyond just putting the camera and showing the information of the city. It's like no, this is actually a POV. Correct me if I'm wrong, but yeah, yeah, it's yeah. like a more of a point of view shot, which is always a stronger choice as opposed to just like getting an insert. No, no, it's why they don't want to tell it like this. I, if you want to know a little bit more about the concept of the movie, I would love it. In my previous film, German Lessons. I have this concept of everything is shot in a very one shot, the, not one shot, but like I have only 90 or 100 shots in the movie. Mm -hmm. And when people are talking, we are never using editing. When you have a dialogue between two guys, like two minutes, five minutes, six minutes, it's only in one take. I didn't want to help the actors' performances. It was like it, it's, it has to happen in front of the camera, and if it's not hap it's not working. There's nothing we can do. It's like and it's like a stay. It's like a play in a way, right? If you're as an actor, and you know what's cool, and I have to talk about this on Saturday. I have a meeting with my good friend and great actor Daniel. Actually, I'm going to make my first play here soon, and it's based on this screenplay that I wrote about my hometown. It's also based on the documentary that we made. It's about basketball in my hometown of North Carolina, but this whole movie. 90 pages takes place inside of a double wide trailer in the middle of no, you know the country and it's made up of eight big sequences and it's eight total takes for the movie i see it very clearly so you're talking about at eight 12 minute takes roughly yeah, and so like yeah. same kind of thing where it's just extended because i want to do what you're talking about i want to like i don't want to hide behind cuts i want to you yeah. know let's get, let's get in there let's all get in there and really just just do something special here well, I mean, it all came from like, what can I do that's contained that can, I can do longer takes, not for a gimmick. I, I know how I feel when I see a really well-made film with like longer takes. It feels like you're just more present, more there, but also just to know just it's, it's complete solid confirmation that these actors are in it, you know? Yeah. And so I realized, well, I need to write a play then because that's kind of what that is as far as the story side of it. And so then after I wrote the screenplay, my friend Matt I then said, you know what, we should workshop this and we should workshop it by doing an actual play. Yeah, I, and when you're saying that you're going to make a, a play, I highly encourage you even more to watch the Romanian films. Okay. They can be very influential in this way of nice. storytelling. I'm excited about that. All of them are like a very small theater play. What about the story? And Winless specifically, why did you have to tell the story? Like, what was it about it? Do you, do you mind sharing? Well, and, and second part of the question, were, were there any autobiographical elements to it? In this kind of movies, you even if you don't want to, you always put autobiographical elements. <laughs> it just happens and there's nothing you can do. In my both feature films, I, I didn't want to put autobiographical moments, but in the end... When you start shooting, you, I was always preparing, like for the German lessons, I was influenced by also Andrei Zwiagintsev and uh, this movie Leviathan. But when I started shooting, it, it, I completely forgot my influences. It was like I was staring in a, some kind of abyss mm -hmm. and you have to feel something to make it 
interesting and you only can turn to yourself. And it was the same with Windless. I was influenced by a book uh, which is called The Passage North by a, sh- a writer who is from Sri Lanka. And yeah. he's, I don't know if I'm able to pronounce his name, but he's called Anuk Arut Pragasam. Yeah. And I like his novel. It's about a guy who is coming home. Uh, its country is torn of civil war by a civil war. Mm-hmm. And it's a very beautiful meditation on contemporary society, the lost relationships between a man and a, and a girl. And I like, it, I like it a lot. And it also deals with this subject of how time is flowing or how time is uh, passing by around us and mm-hmm. what is happening with us, mm-hmm. the subject of memory. And this is what interested me in, the, in this movie, Windless. It's a very simple story about a boy who is coming home to sell the, uh, his late father's apartment. But he starts to understand that uh, he doesn't know where he's coming from or he doesn't remember because he was very small when he left his home country. Apart from memory and time, it's also about the identity, who we are, where we are coming from, what is the the essence that is shaping our ideas, ourselves, or our lives in general. It was so heartbreaking, too, when you see the older characters throughout the film uh, reflecting on the past and how things used to be. I mean, for all of us as human beings, it's like time is, it's a lump in the throat when you think about it, right, a little bit. Nostalgia also, and memory, and like the, and the style, even me and you talking about Ballast in 08, that just took me back to some nostalgic place, you know? It's like, yeah, it's hard to explain. It's this, it's almost like a sad, somber thing sometimes when you're, when you're talking about time. But also, I think I'm happy that I try my best to be in the moment as much as possible, and I am excited for the future. So I don't even know. It's like, I mean, my, my new film, one of my other films that I'm making, is very much about the same topic or the same themes as far as time and mortality and memory. I've been following around a private investigator in L.A. for two years, and like it's, it's a memoir. It's all about, you know, time. And I think, fuck, man, we can all relate to that. It's a trip. But I just appreciated how you ended this film. The arc felt really sad. I was very satisfied as a viewer. Uh, with his arc, you know, with his this final decision that he made toward the end of the film in the last scene. The home video footage at the end. We can cut this out if you don't want to talk about it. No, no, I, I won't. I won't. Yeah, what? I yeah. Talk. What is that your home video footage or what? where did that come from? Uh, it was uh, a very interesting moment when we were editing the movie with my editor. I work with the same editor for a lot of time, like for the last 10 years. And we were editing and one day she came to me and said, uh, have you seen this movie? Everyone is talking about it. It's called After Sun. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and I I didn't, I haven't seen And I watched it and I liked it a lot. And we started to discuss this movie. We liked it very much and we, were, we weren't influenced by it. And after a few days of editing, one day um, she came to me and she said, look what I found just by chance, my sister was coming home these days and she gave me this old DVD and I have uh, this footage of my family in 1991 uh. when we are celebrating some kind of birthday. She she is coming outside. She's, she is not born in Sofia mm-hmm. and it's a smaller town. And when we were editing, we find out that the walls were exactly the same color and everything looked like uh, we shot it for the movie. And it just happened by chance that I decided to use Last it. Last interview I had, we were talking about happy accidents. How like the, It's the film gods being like, here you go. Here you are. The, the god of cinema, yeah. yeah. It was like, uh, uh, it wasn't planned. It wasn't in the script. It was just done by some kind of intuition. Mm. We saw it and we tried it and we liked it very much. I had to ask about it because it's like, okay, is this the director's home video footage? Is this recreated? It like what it felt because it felt right. It fit into it. It didn't feel forced or separate from the narrative. But I'm just like, how did you get this as a filmmaker? It's I I wanted to add this like uh, it's real. 
This is I love that. Footage. Yeah. What is like the biggest uh, takeaway uh, you know, that you would hope an audience member could, could take from this film? I, I was telling this when I was pitching the movie before I shoot it. And actually it happened that after I made it, I still believe in this concept. I wanted to to give the viewers the option of when they watch the movie to be able to meditate on their own life. Mm. I I don't want to 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 make a movie that tells this is the most important story in the world. You have to see it. I believe that it's not. It's not. There's nothing so special in this story, but. I believe that if you're in the right mood, it can give you the option of turn to yourself. Like you watch the cinema screen and you watch some kind of mirror. This mm. is what I wanted to achieve. I think you did that. You did that for me. You did. That, uh, that is important. And I'm try to think about it, but I don't know what are the, what is the formula for this, how we can make movies that you can watch more than once. Mm. This is something very interesting. And I believe it's outside of the standard concepts of uh, narrative or how you tell a story. Yeah, I love that. Uh, and also the value of making something that you can watch more than once is that it's so nice when you've made a movie. I'm to the point now where it's been like 10 years since... I No, wait, let me think about this. It's been... Shit, 25... No been 15 years since I made my first feature and it was a comedy so it's a little you know dated but my point is it's so nice to see the, the the strength in it and like how we put so much care into it because it's so important for me to be able to revisit that movie not to mention the other movie that I made 10 years ago and the one I made five years ago and it's like the more I do this the more I want to make stuff that that's just got that rewatch value for sure because I don't want to just make it just for one time you know you want to have these movies stand the test of time. And this is why this podcast exists in my mind too. It's like, what movies do I not know about or anybody, you know, other people don't know about that doesn't matter the age. And I feel like there's such ageism, right? You know, uh, or ageists in, in film, as far as the, the distribution side, film buyers or whatever. It's like, Oh, your movie's two years old. We don't want that. It's like, but what about the quality of the fucking movie? You know, no, nope, it's not new. So I'm a bit of a tangent, meandering tangent on my end right there. But but no, it's just so important I mean, to make something that's got uh, rewatchability. If not, what are you doing? What are you making? Talk about, uh, so what about distribution? Do you have any plans for Winless? Uh, do you have anything lined up? Or? Uh, we have, this time, I'm very happy that we have a sales agent. Nice. It's, they are called Alpha Violet, and they are doing everything with the festival strategy, the cinema releases in the countries outside of Bulgaria. So, Beautiful. yeah. We'll you feel see. solid. You feel good. Yeah, sales agents are my unsung heroes for sure. They do some things that I would never be able to do. What do you have next? What's your next? Do you have any next projects? Anything cooking on the back burner? Yeah, or front burner? Was, for the past five months, I was writing a script for another feature film. It's called Deconstruction, and it is uh, a little bit more uh, different than the movies that I made until now because it's the first time that the characters are not part of this lower middle class. They are like uh, intellectuals. Okay. It's about, uh, we have only one big uh, observatory with a big telescope that you mm -hmm. can watch the sky. It's very high in the mountains and very beautiful place. And it was built in the end of the 70s. And it's like uh, the set there, it's so old school, so old fashioned. It's like you're in a Suarez by Andrei Tarkovsky in a set. Oh, yeah. Movie. Yeah, yeah. I watched that and the other day again. It's yeah. like the time has stopped there. And I I will try to make something a little bit. Cool. So, Soviet, Soviet architecture, I'm sure. Very. Yeah, yes. Exactly. Oh, yeah, I love that. That sounds fun. Yeah, yeah. You're going to contain it within the mostly the um, the planetarium. I mean, the, the planetarium, yeah, yeah. The, um, yeah. Most of the the story is taking place there. Cool. That's awesome. Um, oh, we didn't talk about real quick. Um, tell me about Taste of Cherry. This was an inspiration for you, right? Yeah, this was. It's actually uh, maybe my favorite film. Okay. Cool. Nice. Yeah. I watched the trailer. 
In the log line, uh, the synopsis reads, a middle-aged Turanian man, uh, Mr. Body, is intent on killing himself and seeks someone to bury him after his demise. Driving around the city, the seemingly well-to-do Body meets with numerous people, including a Muslim student, asking them to take on the job, but initially he has a little luck. Eventually, Body finds a man who is up for the task because he needs the money, but his new associate soon tries to take talk him out of committing suicide. This reminds me of a movie that I worked on as a grip for a, a week called Goodbye Solo, about... Uh, by Ramin Barani. I like, you know the, the director? I worked on that movie as a grip for a week. All the uh, camera shots on the car, a lot, of the, a lot of those shots I helped kind of yeah. rig, you know, rig the camera up and stuff it, back I in like 2008 or something. I, I, when I liked, when I watched Bawaz, then I watched his movie, A Man Push Cut. Oh, I love that movie so much. Yeah, me too. It's funny because my, my roommate, my former roommate, used it is his production designer. Chad Keith. Nice. Um, and it's funny because Ramin had just done Man Push Cart. What was his next movie? Whatever the next movie was. But I, the doorbell rings one day. I'm in Wilmington, North Carolina. It's like, ding dong. When I open the door, it's Ramin Barani. I'm like, what's up? How you doing? And he was just there to like talk to Chad about whatever for the next thing. It's one of those things where, yes, I used to be a grip, but I was on set to make a little money, but I was really on set to observe the Ramin Baranis of the world. Yeah, yeah, and like, man, it was cool to nice. see him work for sure. He was very intimate and very... I don't know, just very like level. It seemed like very, at least the week that I was there, very level and like very precise, yeah, yeah. I guess. And very kind of just, you know, like all the great directors, it seems like just very um, present and there for his actors for sure. In Taste of Cherry, when did this come out? 97? So I wonder if I talk to Ramin Barani one day, if I ask him if this was an inspiration for Goodbye Solo. I, I believe. Yeah. It, it's not possible that it's not. That's what I was kind of thinking. And me I just popped in the head. It. Wow. I cannot imagine it. Yeah. But it's okay, right? It's like we get inspiration and we yeah, go with course, it. I mean, this yeah, is important to do. It's, it's totally okay. If you had the opportunity to remake any movie. I, I, I believe that I don't remember if I ever watched a remake that is better than the original. But when I know that I'm going to fail either way. <laughs> I will try to do the impossible and just enjoy the maybe doing Stalker by Andrei Tarkovsky. Stalker, oh. Stalker. Wow. Yeah. It's impossible, but it's going to be a lot of fun. Just don't get uh, cancer from radiation, I guess. Yeah. And it will be it will be interesting to to read the hate comments after we, <laughs> we make it. Yeah, good luck with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any um final I don't know, inspiration you can give us uh, that you've learned along your filmmaking journey so far? Yeah, it's uh, there is a very big inspiration for me in an American director, actually. When you we start talking about Goodbye So, I actually really liked uh, Kelly Reichardt. She makes a lot of indie American films with Michelle Williams, and what, her most famous film is called Wendy and Lucy. No. She's really... One of the best indie filmmakers these days. Nice. Okay. Look at that. But she's a very, very indie. Her movies are like very subtle and I like her a lot. Okay. Nice. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much for taking the time. Great movie, dude. Uh, and, and have fun at Karlovy and good luck. And, and if you're ever in LA, hit me up. Email me. Please like and subscribe to this podcast and follow us on social media at Past, Present, Feature. And let us know in the comments section what movies you're watching. Thank you so much for listening to the Past, Present, Feature podcast, and we'll see you next time. Peace.